Hello, Australia. Welcome to my millennial money. I'm pumped for this episode today. I've got Vanessa Bennett joining me. G'day, Vanessa. How are you? Hello. I'm very well. How are you doing? I'm good. We caught up in 2019, and for everyone uh, who is a new listener, that was episode 251 about being the best version of you. And we're going to have a lot of fun today and talk about mental health, burnout, performance, mindset, because all that stuff kind of meshes in together. So I've asked Vanessa to come back up to the studio and answer your questions. Vanessa, are you interested in playing a game? Always love playing games. Well, let's break the ice because we've now got meaningful money cards and they're a deck of conversation starters. And if you're watching the episode on the YouTube channel, um, it's a big deck of cards and they've got random questions. Now, you might want to pull these out if you've got friends over having, you know, some cheese and wine or you might want to pull these out if the, the family dinner's getting boring or I dare say if you're on your first date, you might pull this out. Um, so Where were you all the years ago before I got married? I know, right? <laughs> so these meaningful money cards, there's about 50 random questions. We sell them for, I think, $39 on our website. And I want to thank Azaria Bell, host of Gen Z Money, for helping me put these together. And we just want to, one, get you cool stuff out there to use. And two, we want to make money so we can keep this podcast alive, basically. <laughs> so, Vanessa, randomly grab a couple of... Oh, we'll go one at a time. It's more dramatic. One at a time. Okay. There so, you've go. got your first card. What does that say? What was your last treat purchase or treat yourself purchase oh i love these i do these a lot yeah yeah so uh i'm very pro facials on a very regular basis uh i think anything to do with that's always really nice um as far you know what shopping's actually been a little trickier now because like i actually tend to do a lot of mine overseas and obviously i don't do that anymore so um i have actually developed one of my covid skills is online shopping so never really got into that before but now i'm all over it so i think uh probably just getting a lot more stuff kind of online that's just easier than having to go out and get it so that gives me the gift of time and that's awesome love that well, Vanessa, you are one of the first people to use the Meaningful Money Card. So, thank you, everybody, for jumping onto the shop, uh, buying some cool, fun stuff to use with your friends or your first date. It's probably more of a third date thing, really, isn't it? <laughs> probably, It's kind yeah. of like I'm still getting to know you. You know me enough not to weed you out. You're back to the third date, so clearly you're half interested um, well, there might be some deal breakers in there, which might be, be kind of good to weed out on the first day. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So burnout, it's a big issue. It's a real issue for some people. Uh, I asked the Facebook group, um, I asked the Facebook group if they've got any questions around this topic of mental health, burnout, performance, and mindset. And I really want to tailor this episode specifically answering questions to the community. Uh, because that's what we're here for, right? To add value and help. Melanie Jane says, coping with burnout with love from a healthcare worker. So she just wants to know, and if we start the conversation with more of some motherhood statements around burnout, and then we can move to some of the next questions. Absolutely. So burnout is now very much a thing. It's it's officially uh, diagnosed as a syndrome under the international classification of diseases. So um, so it's it's not a disease per se, uh, and it's not a disorder, but it is a syndrome, and it can manifest itself in many different ways. You can. Uh, feel it physically. So it's just this constant level of tired, which is probably where your adrenal glands are really not doing too well. And they're having that physical burnout, which means you just can't get the level of energy that you require just to even do basic things, which is awful. And obviously that's something that happens over the longer term. Um, It can also happen mentally. So we just have this inability of just like everything's just too hard. We're probably starting to have some form of anxiety, maybe some depressions coming through or at least some of those symptoms, even if we don't have a diagnosis, because you don't just be fine one day and then wake up with depression or anxiety the next. These Mm. things tend to build. So they all tend to work in together. 
together. And so often the physical signs can lead to the mental issues or it can go the other way around. So it might be a mental issue leading into the physical tiredness and everything. So there's quite a lot of different areas of this. And I think one thing we need to be clear on is is what burnout isn't. You know, you go out and you have a few late nights and, and you're not getting much sleep and all of that kind of thing. It's like, well, you can't do that on a sustained basis. But if you're doing that and you're feeling a bit tired, well, you're possibly just tired. Mm. So it's really how long this goes on for. So if it's going on for an extended period and you're not managing your energy properly, then you're going to run out of it and your body can just only go for so long before it will just shut down physically and or mentally in some way, shape or form. And forgive me, Vanessa, uh, but I actually didn't uh, formally introduce you at the start of the episode or just before we dive straight in because I was a bit excited. <laughs> um, I believe you're a subject matter expert around this uh, performance, uh, if you will, uh, in terms of body, mind and workplace, lifestyle, all that stuff. Can you tell us um, what you do, who you are and what your deepest secret is? Oh, wow. Uh, Yes. So I uh, am a high performance coach. Uh, I've been doing this for about eight, nine years now. And I used to work in financial services. So I used to be a corporate girl and uh, I still work with a lot of corporates now. So I kind of still feel like I'm in there. (laughs) But, uh, But I've always been really mindful of how to perform better with less effort. And I used to be really mindful of leading my teams that way because I figured if my teams were getting burnt out, that's my fault. That's a leadership issue. So this is something that we all need to take responsibility to help people with. And this was probably, you know, way before it was even a thing. So people kind of thought I was probably a little bit weird talking about this kind of stuff back then, but I just thought it was such an important topic. So um, so then I ended up becoming even more and more passionate about this and doing a lot more reading and a lot more research. Uh, and so now I'm at the pointy end of my master's in psychology and neuroscience of mental health. So, so much more research, even even just in the last five to 10 years around neuroscience and how that's interacting with the way that we think, uh, how we can actually control uh, the way that we think and, uh, and the way that that can therefore change the shape of our brains literally. But this was not information that we had many years ago. Mm. So super, super exciting stuff. It's also around this idea of cognitive energy. So your brain is really hungry. It's like whatever, it could be say 20 to 25% of the food that you take in goes to your brain. So that's quite a lot. Mm. So be careful what you feed it, (laughs) firstly. Um, But secondly, it's like we need to know how to spend less cognitive energy. And that's where a lot of people are going into burnout. And I just used to see so many people spinning their wheels, not being productive, looking really busy, but not necessarily being super productive. So if you're just spinning your wheels and spinning your wheels and looking busy and looking busy, but not really producing those results, then that has a massive effect on your physical and mental health. It's not sustainable. Um, And, you know, just basic things like asking for a pay rise. Well, Mm. Justify your existence first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And looking busy is as a leader, that's not what I'm after. I'm after results. Yeah. So you've kind of been involved in this um, high level performance because a lot of your clients would be high end executives. And, you know, if there's a CEO of a top 200 Australian company, for example, um, how they perform can be make or break for a listed company. Exactly. So. What's some of the other work you're doing with uh, Next Evolution Performance? Is that the name of yeah, it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. I always it. worry. <laughs> Sometimes it's I say the competitor's words. name it's when I'm talking to people. <laughs> <laughs> that we would edit out. Yeah, that's no. right. Yeah. <laughs> we, are, we are Next Evolution Performance. And, and you're right. We do do a lot of work with uh, senior leaders in the corporate space. But we also do a lot of work with small business owners or mm. small to medium businesses. So we tend to work with the high performers in each of those areas. It's not like we only work with big companies or mm. we only work in a particular profession or industry. It's like we want to work with high performers and people who want to be 
in that space. Yeah. So we focus on that and um, and we really want to get this cascading down to people at all levels. So even if I work with a large firm, I could be working anyone from the CEO to the graduates because um, I think it's such an important thing to be able to get across. And if you get this right when you're 20, it's a mm. lot easier when you're 40, 45. There's a lot of work that I have to do is because people didn't know this 20 mm. to 30 years ago. So two things after that fabulous introduction. Number one, everyone listening, what I want my challenge to you when you're listening to this episode, like every episode, but this episode so much more, what is one thing that you can take from this episode and implement tomorrow? If that is saying no, I'm gonna mm. say no at least twice this week or whatever that is. Number two, we are going to do a, a My Millennial Business episode with uh, Vanessa as well. So, if you're a small business owner or want to hear more about uh, Vanessa's stuff, you can subscribe to My Millennial Business, our business podcast. Uh, but I, I personally, you know, I'm just about what are the one percenters that I can pick up along the way? And um, I'll probably share with you a little bit about my story as a self-employed person on the business podcast about how I'm implementing some of the stuff that uh, you talked about when you were on the podcast last mm, as well. Amazing, so, good. So, Alice Holmes, uh, do you want to read her kind of statement? Uh, and I don't know if some of these are statements or questions or talking points, but I think they're good discussion starters. Yeah, there's quite a bit in here. So, how to find mental health support on low income wages. Yeah, that's that's an important one because it can be really costly to do that. So, I guess a lot of this is kind of looking, sometimes there can be online courses and things like that. And that's one of the reasons we've just put it out because uh, we, want, we, we think that everyone of all income levels deserve access to this kind of information. So, so, um, so that's definitely one thing, but also uh, surrounding yourself with right, the right people mm. as well. So I find that if you if you surround yourself with other people who have good mental health, it's a lot easier to have good mental health. So even just something as simple as that might be a way to get started, and therefore you can you know feed off other people and things like that. And mm. there's so much great information these days on you know Instagram and YouTube and whatever else. So I think that's usually a good place to start. Can I? jump in and give some unsolicited advice mm, sure. to everybody as I do every episode <laughs> <laughs> lol <laughs> um, I would just always encourage anyone on the whole burnout mental health whatever um, I honestly think in my life the first port of call is my GP mm, yeah good point so just an encouragement uh, chat to your GP uh, if you're really in a dark place you know there's lifeline 24 hours uh, beyond blue um, so there is immediate support mm -hmm. and also your GP and I know that um, the government have uh, the mental health plans and you can find people to talk to even um, probably bulk build for the first six or so mm -hmm. ten I think they increased it to uh, appointments for that one-on-one -on -one talk therapy so uh, I, I think we're fortunate enough in this society that lower income earner does, doesn't equal no support for mental health. Yeah. Yep. Um, anyway, mm. well, we can wrap the episode up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really wreck your flow. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. That's, that's, that's very useful. So, uh, recognising burnout. I think we've talked a little bit about that already, just making sure that it could be mental, it could be physical, but when you just feel like you're losing interest in things that you used to really enjoy doing, um, feeling tiredness, feeling lack of energy for really no apparent reason, especially if you're still eating okay and things like that. Um, uh, you know, inability to exercise if you're just really that tired, that kind of thing. So, it kind of, it's a bit of a spectrum. It doesn't happen all at once, but recognizing those signs as they start, it's a lot easier to intervene mm. and then fix it rather than wait till you really have a problem of burnout, in which case it's a lot harder to come back. You know, adrenal fatigue can take six months to come back and you literally, you can't move. Like mm. it's just so exhausting. Is that proven in like science yet, the actual adrenal fatigue? Yeah. So what, there's a lot of noise out there. Yeah. No, what happens is um, it's called your... Um, your HPA axis. And so what that is, it's like um, when you are stressed, you release a hormone called cortisol, which is absolutely perfect for short term, getting away from a saber-toothed tiger, dealing with a, a deadline that we have 
immediately right now and we just need some good focus time. So it actually gets you into the performance zone, right? I'm smiling because so. I'm thinking like of a joke, like, or like going to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or just go a to work. A toxic workplace, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And the thing is, but our bodies were designed to have cortisol pumping through us probably about once a week yeah. to get away from a really life threatening experience. Mm. But now, and cortisol takes about 25 hours to get to dissipate within your body. So if you're pumping cortisol into your body every 15 minutes from these like first world stressful problems that we're having, having at work, it just keeps building up and it becomes toxic. So what happens is um, it actually, uh, it stops your ability to be able to like, um, to, to, it'll just keep pumping this through and all of a sudden your adrenals just go, that's it, I'm done. And to the point where it then can't produce cortisol anymore. And then that's when you've just got to like let them rest. Yeah. There's really not, you know, it's not like a pill you can take. There's some naturopathic things that I've heard of, but there's really not a great deal you can do. It's not like you just get a shot or take a pill and all of a sudden your adrenals are back in business. Yeah. So you definitely don't want to get to that stage. Right. Okay. That's cool. Uh, I might move on uh, because we mm. can deal with a bit of um, the toxic workplaces and yes. uh, management as we go. Mm. I'm going to read this uh, and I'll say it's a paragraph from Cassie Masters. How to address when a coworker is overworking themselves to a point that it begins to set an unspoken precedent for the rest of the office. A coworker has been sleeping in the office in order to meet deadlines, but without making that overly known to the project managers. This has begun to make future deadlines to be set uh, to shorter timelines because they've seen that we are able to get it done before. Uh, He's a hard worker just with unhealthy work-life balance. Oh, sounds like me. I sleep at my work uh, <laughs> <laughs> upstairs. Uh, unfortunately, it's starting to unintentionally bring everyone else into that lifestyle too. It's hard to address because he's the only one doing it, um, et cetera, et cetera. So hmm. we've got uh, a bit of a, an office culture that's been set by maybe someone who is burning out and getting the job done mm-hmm. and we're all getting sucked up into that. Yeah. So a couple of things to think about there is this is actually a really old school way of thinking about what performance is and it's not sustainable. So if you want to do that for really short periods of time, your body will probably let you get away with it. If you want to do that for like 40 years of work, no, it's definitely not going to happen. Mm. So you've got a few issues there. I would say firstly, focus on redefining what performance is. Performance is actually getting the job done and getting it done in the most efficient way as possible. So we are all about how do you achieve more, get more done in less time with less effort because we shouldn't be feeling like we're killing ourselves every day. That's not sustainable for 20, 30, 40 years. That's so good. Awful, awful. You know, we're just, we're going to be living a lot longer. We want to make sure that we have quality of life and that if we want to work up to 90, we can, but we can't work in the way that this person's been mentioned here. It's so funny because this year I'm like really trying to be intentional and it's probably the first year where I've been embarrassed because so many people have said, what have you got planned for this year? And I say nothing because my intentional thing for this year is to do less, but do it better. Great. And... I don't know. I just, I'm just excited talking about this stuff. Yeah. And so you should be excited by that. Like, yeah, but not it's feel bad. But I guess what I'm, yeah, it's the social norms. Yeah. It's the cultural norms of busy, 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 do, 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 new project, new project, new project. Where this is really, I don't know why we're going here, but I really love some of the different cultures around the world. Um, I've been to Fiji and. Uh, like a lot of the Fijians, they just live. Mm. And there's that thing, Fiji time. We're just living. I'm sure stress is not a big deal there. I've been to Indonesia, the Balinese. There's a lot of people just sitting around, chilling. They're working. But it's just this, I don't know, this industrial complex that has snuck into our society and the just living isn't happening. Mm. That's right. We've sort of glorified busy for too long. Mm. It's like busy is a good thing. It's like, no, busy is a bad thing. Mm. Getting stuff done and producing results is a good thing. 
for whatever that definition is for you, not for anyone else, for you. Uh, but just looking busy and being tired, no, it's not sustainable. It's not a way to live a life and it's just dumb. So what would you say to Cassie, you know, because it's affecting her, it's affecting the office. Um, you can't control other people. One person can't control office culture, particularly if you're not in management or leadership. What do we say to Cassie who's sucked up into this vortex? Mm, yeah, it's, it's a tough one when it's happening around you, but it's really important to have boundaries and to really spend time focusing on the work that you do and getting the results because there's no point working 12 hours to do something that you could do in six. And interestingly enough, we only have between four on average, maximum six hours a day that our brain can do heavy cognitive work. Mm. So if you're trying to think and kid yourself that you're doing heavy cognitive work more than that, it's not going to happen. So the beauty of it these days is we've got so much more neuroscience to kind of back us up when we say that. I remember when I worked in corporate ages ago, you know, to be, oh, yes, I'm going to the gym at lunch or I'm off to teach a class. And people are like, really? And kind of looking at you like funny. I'm like, yeah, it's making me really productive. But I didn't have a whole stack of information to back that up with back then. Uh, now we do. Yay. Yeah. So, so I think now it's like really kind of bringing this information to people to say that's not the way that we get stuff done. And if you only have four to six hours a day, do the math. Mm. Like it doesn't make sense to work 16. And that's not to say that we can't do lighter tasks in there as well. And we do a lot of um, work around this in the course, helping people to understand how their cognitive energy is, how to use their cognitive energy better then that actually works out okay. So once you do that and you can get more done, I've always been, because I've always, um, and I've had to face this in the workplace as well. I've had to face this when I was leading a team and I was wanting my team to you know, work proper hours, not you know, look like they're looking busy till late and everything. And I've had to defend that to directors in the business who were like, no, everyone should be chained to their desk for 16 hours a day and that's productivity. Mm. And so I've had to defend this. So I've had to very much focus on the results. No, we will get this done. We will deliver these targets. We will deliver this. This will be done. If there's a problem with the results, you let me know. But if there isn't, you can back off. So I've had some very frank conversations in the past. Luckily, people are having to have less of them these days. But I would say, don't be afraid to stand up for that and go, actually, no, I'm going to promise you this and I will get this done, but I'm not working 16 hours a day. That's just whack. Yeah. And I think that is uh, for someone like Cassie to show personal leadership in the yep. team. And it's funny, it just reminded me something, and I hate um, having intimate staff conversations on the podcast, but I've been meaning to say to Nath, um, you know, because Nath is our editor, hey, Nath, um, you know, he's got some deep work. So there's this Cal Newport's book, Deep yeah, Work. Yeah, love it. Uh, it's really challenging. I've been meaning to say to you, Nath, like, bet like if you do a, a – and I was – proud like he was working the other day his phone was over here away from him and all that i'd probably say nath punch out a podcast episode deep work grab your phone go for a walk around the block go sit in the hammock out the back for 10 minutes just press reset mm. um so you've got permission to do that i'll just keep forgetting to tell him but it just <laughs> reminded me it's because we can't just be like on 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 on, on, on. <laughs> like it's just got to be, yeah. Exactly. Your brain needs breaks just like your body does. Mm. So we call it periodization techniques and yeah. this is very much from the athletic world. So athletes don't train heavy every single day. Yeah. They just don't. They yeah. would suffer burnout. They'd start to tear muscles and it would take them, you know, months of recovery to get back. So they know that it's much better to have a rest day mm. than it is to push forward and split something. Yeah, because in the workplace, and this is the dance between um, that maturity of you pay me to do this role, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. So Nate's welcome to have a break or whatever, but – and I'm not heaps talking specifically about Nate, but it's like <laughs> if the stuff's not getting done and you're out there on the hammock all day, that's a problem. Exactly. That's a performance problem. Yep. But so you've just got to be very self-aware that um, I value my energy, I value my time, I will deliver performance because I reckon as an employer, I would rather performance outcome than you've sat at a desk for eight hours outcome. 100%. 
but that's changing a 1920s factory mentality of a yeah. production line. So true. Yep. You said a magical word, um, the B word, and we don't usually say bitch on the podcast. No, joking. Um, <laughs> Jess Pearson, one of my other staff members, wrote a comment, how to set boundaries, because you mentioned yeah. boundaries. Mm-hmm. Um, so, how would you set boundaries that are healthy as an employee? Yeah. Boundaries are super important in all areas of our lives. So, definitely as an employee, it's about realizing the more that you can tap into how you work effectively, then the more you will have conviction to set those boundaries, to say, no, I am really productive during these times. So ideally I don't want meetings during these times. And the more that you can tap into that, because you'll be streets ahead of everyone else who doesn't know this stuff, then other meetings will fall in around you. Mm. And so you'll actually start to get the way that you want to structure your day. So the first thing is, is to tap into what is the best way for you to structure your days. And we you know, do a lot of this on the course. So it's when you can work out what is best for you as to how to structure your days, your weeks, your months, your years, then you'll produce more. Once you start to produce more and you get results, no one can really get angry by that. Mm. It's like, you're paying me for these results and I'm getting you these results. So now you're in a pretty good place just to say, back off. Yeah. So it's setting those boundaries around, no, I'm not going to take calls at whatever time at night, depending on what role you're in and all but that that's kind of thing. The, But Vanessa, and I guess that goes back to that um, self-awareness maturity thing. Mm. You're not going to tell your boss to back off or your team to back off if you're not delivering what your job is. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and it's because it's just so... You know, if you're in a job and I'm just thinking of a nurse on the ward all day, you're running, you're running, you're running. Mm. I don't know. Like it, it's going to be tough. It's going to be busy. And maybe the boundary is, I'm sorry, I need my scheduled break. Mm-hmm. I'm no longer walk, working through lunch. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Uh, but if I'm not the best version of me, I'm not the best version of me. Absolutely. And that's starting to get more out there now in terms of like we need to – self-care is not selfish. We need to take care of ourselves mm. so that we can take care of other people. So whether that's at work, take care of our teams, take care of clients, patients, depending on what you're in, you know, it's we have to take care of ourselves first. I had a couple of boundary issues just this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, t- I, I get Good people on, on each other. Yeah, that's Let's right. Go. That's right. I just get people on the podcast to um, to help with <laughs> Glennie's uh, personal issues. Um, but it's a good example of, um, you know, last year before COVID hit, I'd basically agreed to do a couple of speaking events. Okay. One of them was a, a free speaking event. I'd come and do the uh, money money session or whatever. The other one was a paid speaking event. Um, and my price has kind of tripled since then mm, uh, just because of the markets and whatnot. And COVID happened, press pause. And just the last week, I've had two events come back and say, hey, can we put this back on the agenda? One of them was a no cost. One of them was a paid, but at a low rate. Mm. Um, and the email sat in my inbox and I couldn't reply to them for maybe two or three days because I felt guilty because I really didn't want to do them. Mm -hmm. Because if I replied and said, yes, I'll do that, it would have been hell for me. Like, because I just wasn't in it, you know. I've just, if I do a free event, it's strategic because it's a charity or, Mm -hmm. I, you know, or I really feel like, you know, I don't know, it's weird. You just got to say no. Um, And I just said, no, I just can't do this anymore. Things have changed. Um, And I said, but John's great at that. Because John's a really good teacher and I get so drained. And I said, I just can't do these because they zap me. So I've got to be very strategic. Mm. And so for me, the boundary thing, I had to learn that saying no and protecting my own energy and vibe was more important than maybe letting someone down Mm -hmm. for whatever that's worth. Yeah, no, that's a really good realization. Oh, gosh. Sorry, everyone. (laughs) I apologize. But if I'm not the best version of me, I can't be the best version of me when I'm on doing the podcast or whatnot. You ready for another question? Hit me. Jaden has another question around burnout about, you know, how to perform well on the first day of a new job or you're in a new job because obviously you, you want to impress but you don't want to go hard and then hit a wall. Mm. How do we manage that expectations and set the rules for my own boundaries and 
um, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's actually a good thing to kind of get that stuff out in the interview process. Yeah. So if you can sort of start asking questions around the culture and things like that, um, you can start to get out some of that information. So if, if the culture is, oh, yes, we all work 16 hour days till we're dragging ourselves everywhere, it's like, mm, okay, maybe we need to rethink this. Mm. <laughs> um, but once you get there, um, I'm a big fan of just enthusiasm, enthusiasm, positivity. You know, if you, if you convince people that you want to be there, they're going to want to have you there. So I think it's more of an attitude thing on that first day. At it's like, yep, I'm keen to help. I'm keen to do all of this. And when people know that your heart's in the right place, then you're actually in more of a position to start to set boundaries as well. And again, it just comes down to results. Like when people get results, you like you can write your own ticket. Mm. That's it. If you produce results and you get trusted and known for producing results and doing things that help other people in the business. And if you're client-facing, getting great results. If you're not client-facing... You're helping someone who's helping a client. Every business has clients. So if you are producing the results, it becomes so much easier to have all these conversations. So come in there, great attitude, get some trust and, and get some quick wins going on. And, uh, and you can pretty much write your own way of doing things from there. Because it's so funny, like the boundary thing, clear boundaries, uh, I'm results driven, probably leads to performance, which from would basically mean I, I've got a better chance of having better mental health and mindset. Mm-hmm. It's like this cascading thing. Yeah, they're all related. Can I jump in and ask you a question or maybe some comment? Uh, when I had a, a business in the city, and I think 2013, 2011, 2012, uh, it became apparent that I, it just wasn't a good fit. Mm-hmm. And it was... It was, a, it was a mental health event for me, uh, but it was more uh, of that reactive depression. Mm. So I was really depressed mm-hmm. and I did some talk therapy and the results at that time, it wasn't medication. I'm, I'm medicated now and I tried to come off at the end of last year and it was just hell. I was a different person and I've resolved that no, I actually need the medication, Mm -hmm. but around the reactive depression, the moment I I remember with the psychologist, he's like, I don't think that's a good fit for you. Like, just call me crazy, but everything you're saying, this can't go on. Mm. As soon as I entered that business, almost overnight, the depression left Mm. because it was, I'm carrying this thing that wasn't a good fit. So maybe can you talk about the dance between a, a clinical depression, a reactive depression, and maybe the signs of more of that reactive depression. Because we go through times, and I even think being medicated, I've got a really healthy baseline of my own mental health now. The reactive depression, it still has popped up. And I know it's a symptom of something in the physical or in my life that isn't right that needs to be addressed. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Take that intro of what you will with what you will. Gosh, how long can I talk for on this one? So, uh, so clinical depression is actually only a very small percentage. It's like less than 10% of depression cases. But how many cases of depression are there out there Mm. worldwide these days? And I'm sure COVID certainly hasn't helped those stats either. Absolutely. So, um, so the 90% being this sort of situational um, reactive depression. So this is like a situation happens and then it's how you respond to it. So it's actually not the situation itself. It's your response to that. Now that is determined by a number of things. We call it a biopsychosocial approach. So part of it's genetics. Okay. Now, before we sort of all give up and go, oh, well, you know, I've got genetics in my family, therefore that's a life sentence for me to have depression. Not necessarily. We can actually switch those genes off these days, but we need to, you know, there's a bit to it. So you need to kind of understand a bit more of that. Um, But the situational stuff is really, really important. So um, the the psychological side of things is, um, is how we react to a situation. So it's not the situation, it's how we react to it. Mm. So, you know, you see people in COVID and um, and it, it is interesting, you know, I've been using this a lot recently in, in the speaking events that I've been doing, but COVID, people will say, oh, we're all in the same boat. It's like, no, no, we're not. We're all in the same storm. We're all in different boats. Some people are in the super yachts just charging through it. <laughs> and other people are in a dinghy just going, oh my gosh, help me. As long as you're <laughs> not in my new boat, it keeps breaking down and costing me money. <laughs> 
<laughs> there you go, right? So, uh, so it's, it's everyone's in a different situation. And this is kind of like how we are in terms of how we can learn to appraise things differently. So there's a concept called neuroplasticity, which is I just love. Okay, so I'm from financial services. Used to think compound interest was the eighth wonder of the world. Move over compound interest. It's now neuroplasticity. Awesome. So I love it. So neuroplasticity is just a fancy word for basically saying that your brain is like a muscle. And so we can actually train our brains the same way as we can train our bodies, physically and mentally. So if we learn how to appraise things in a way that is helpful. Now, I'm not really into the whole, oh, let's just think positive about every situation. No, some situations are just really sucky and we, mm. you know, we can't do that. So, so I prefer to think of it as helpful thinking. We can actually train our brains to think in a helpful way about a situation. So this is being uh, solution focused. So rather than just focusing, I have a problem, I have a problem, I have a problem. Helpful thinking is what's a solution? Who could I talk to? What are different ways of thinking about this? How could I come up with a way that, you know, I would actually cope with that situation? So when you can kind of do a bit more of that, your brain, you can train your brain to do more of that. The more you do, the more you do. And, and ironically, it's the same as being fit. Like the, the more you train, the easier it is to train. Mm. It's far easier to exercise when you're already fit. Mm. So let's try to practice this neuroplasticity and we call it self-directed neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity is happening to everyone all day, every day. Okay. The issue is, is if you don't know how to self-direct it, it will happen for the negative because our brain's wired for the negative and to look for danger and to build up our defense mechanisms. So we're always looking for danger and we're, and that could be a psychological danger in most cases these days. There's not too many saber tooth tigers around there anymore. So neuroplasticity is happening. The trick is... If you know how to do self-directed neuroplasticity, you can actually train it for the better. So if you're already fit, it's easy to train. So just because you haven't had burnout and haven't had a mental health issue, that's the time when you train. So can you give me some low-hanging fruit practical example? Mm. So I liken it to it depends on your level of mental fitness, the same as physical fitness. So we're not going to say someone who's been sitting on the couch for 20 years, go and run a marathon, you'll feel amazing. It's like, no, you'll kill them. For them, it's put your shoes on. Then the next day, it's put your shoes on, walk to the door. So it's all these little things that we can we can start training people and it's the same concept mentally. So if your level of mental fitness isn't great, you don't wait till a disaster happens and then try to go, oh, how do I think really helpfully about this? The easiest way to start is just every day, use little triggers to start thinking about, you know, why is life good? Okay, mm. what am I grateful for today? So I use the trigger of when I'm walking my dog, I think about things that I'm really grateful for. What type of dog? I've got a little Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Name? Buster. I love it. He's 11. And oh my goodness, he is just amazing. And he's got so much energy. He loves going out and walking around. COVID's been the best thing ever. It's, it's He's in the shape of his life thanks to COVID. When it's I also pushed travel. up the price of puppies about a billion dollars. <laughs> I know, right? I'm glad I got him 11 years ago. Cheapest chips back then. Uh, and so he's amazing. And so I actually wrote a blog, what I learned about mindfulness from my dog. Mm. You know, I'm sure I've done a fancy module on, on mindfulness at one of the best um, universities in the world. But I learned a lot from Buster. Mm. You know, he just wants to smell everything. He's so excited when he gets pats. Mm. He just wants love. He notices everything. He's just on the lookout for great things that are happening. And he's really appreciative to be out and about. He loves nature. So we can do a lot of those things just every day when things are going well. And what that does is it just builds stronger neural pathways for helpful thinking. There's a... Um <sighs> I won't go there. I won't go there. I'll offend too many people. Let's um <laughs> Oh no, let's go there. <laughs> oh, it's just like I I want to acknowledge that people get handed a really crap hand mm -hmm. in life. So yeah. we we don't all get a perfect family, good income, good job. Mm -hmm. I want to just touch on, because basically 
I guess everything that you've said is the opposite to a victim mentality. Yes. And uh, the the mentality of the world owes me. I want everything for free. I want this. I, 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 I. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if, what it's worth, but um, yeah, no, I don't know if you want to comment before the break. Yeah, sure. No, I think um, that's an interesting one, and and you're right. This whole victim mentality, not cool. So it actually doesn't matter what hand you've been dealt. I got plenty of people who I know who have been dealt a great hand, still manage to have a victim mentality. And that's the <laughs> that's the caveat. It's like yeah. you can have all the money in the world and still think the world's out to get you and you're exactly. a victim and blah, that's blah, right. blah. Exactly. So, um, so I think that you can have that mentality regardless of your situation. Mm-hmm. Now, if you've had childhood trauma, yes, that is – that's a whole other ballgame. And that's I, – I just want to acknowledge yep. – that for sure life happens and I, sure. I get it. That's right. Yeah. But it's really interesting. You can have children from the same family who really have been dealt the same hand mm. and yet who will have completely different attitudes to how they see the world, mm. to how they see life and how they will be proactive in their performance. Mm. So I, I think that there's still a lot of scope for people to choose their responses to situations. We're not going to say every situation is amazing, but we still always have the ability to choose our response to what's going on. And the more that we learn how to do that and that we are in control, you know, it's interesting. I'm reading a few of these comments here and it's like, you know, what if the work situation's like this and what if that and what if something else? And it's like, you're never stuck. Mm. Actually, on that, um, if you are... um struggling and you have been dealt and you have been dealt uh, a bad hand mm. and you're hearing this and you're like, I just can't see myself getting there. I would encourage you. You're not alone. Mm. Get some help. Yeah. Have it. And yeah, I, I don't want to go there too much because I know that there are some deep, dark crap things that happen to people. Of course. But I would always just encourage everybody. You're not alone. Speak mm. to your GP psychologist, counsellor, yep. good life-giving friends. Mm-hmm. And I like to say life-giving friends, not jealous bitches or whatever that they come. And Energy he's like, oh, we suckages. don't. Yeah, yeah, like all that stuff. Yep. So you need your people yeah. that you can bank on. And if you're out there and you've got no one, this is one of the reasons we do this podcast because we want to be in your corner. Mm. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll just talk about um, – Recovery, getting through, and maximizing productivity. Mm. So we'll be right back. Okay, we're back. Vanessa, tell us about the program that you run online. Yeah, so it's called the Neuroscience of Getting More Done. Mm. Sounds good, yeah? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't want a science-based way to help you to get more done? So we call it the Neuroscience of Getting More Done. It's on our it's on our uh, virtual training platform. So Next Evolution Performance is our main platform and that's where we've got a lot of our philosophies and all that kind of thing on there. Uh, the platforms talk to each other so you can actually get to the online training platform via nextevolutionperformance.com. Com. And we'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Or you can go straight there. We call it Next Evolution Energy. We thought this is what we want to do. We want to be able to understand how to manage our cognitive energy in so many different ways based on mindset, based on productivity. So this one is really focused on the productivity side of things. This is literally helping you to structure your days, your weeks, your months, your years for performance. Now, it's not telling you the exact formula. It is telling you the process that you can work out your own own formula, which is going to work for you. And it's basically helping you to tap into understanding your own brain. Mm. And when you understand that, you can maximize what we call those four hours of power. Yeah. If you maximize the four hours of power, you know what? It takes most people eight hours to get four hours worth of work done. Mm. Seriously. So if you manage to maximize your four hours worth of um, hour of power and you can get four hours done really solidly in that time and you get extra work done on top of that, that's a bonus, right? And it's going to save you so much more mental energy. It's going to save you from burnout. It's going to get you results. Once you've got results, then you're going to be able to 
work and set your boundaries according to how you want to work. It's going to give you the mindset and the confidence to have a conversation with other people at work around this. Mm. And worst comes to worst, it's going to give you the confidence to get a new job that pays more where you can set your own boundaries. Yeah. So <laughs> That's a good result. Totally. So, if you do want to have a look at the course, uh, it's in US dollars because Vanessa and her team Uh, Most of their clients are international uh, in America, in Europe, and the US is kind of the, you know, everyone knows the US dollars. So, it's in US dollars. Uh, It's 450 US dollars, but you've got uh, basically a $75 discount, which works out to be just under $100 Australian. Mm. uh, That brings it down to $480 Australian for M3 listeners. Just use the code M3 when you're checking out uh, and that discount will be applied. Now, I know that that's a lot of money for some people. Mm -hmm. I know you get what you pay for. Yeah. So, my challenge to you out there is can you show this to your boss, show this to your workplace because I know that teams have professional development budgets and can you get creative with somebody else to help you fund this, whether you go hards, whether they do it. Uh, so, I think if you really do want to get dialed in, get some uh, performance really happening and add some value to your life, I would recommend uh, getting stuck into this course. Yeah. And you raise a great point. You know, this is something that uh, we see a lot of people, the employers will will pay for. Yeah. Um, and they'll, they'll actually in a lot of cases, pay for it all. Um, Like to be honest, if my team came to me and said, I want to do this because of X, Y, and Z, I'd be like, $500, bring it on, baby. Like if you're that dialed in with wanting to nail that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I will say there's a lot of people that are listening who are head of uh, big teams and whatnot. Uh, Be sure to reach out to Vanessa, maybe on their website direct um, if you want more of a corporate solution, yeah, um, that could be the best way there. That's right, because this uh, this course that we've put together, we've uh, split it down into eight modules, and it's drip fed over six weeks. Yeah, okay. Um, and it's really the basis. We've got a few extra modules in there as well, but one of our really popular base workshops that we do for teams all the time where we introduce this concept of energy credits, personal pace, helping you to work at your attention span that works for you, helping you to find your hours of power and use these periodization techniques. All of this we've been doing the corporate space as a half day workshop for a long time Mm. and super, super successful. Um, And then people are now using the course as part of the induction program where that becomes the way that people work. So it's one of these things where, you know, we just thought that it shouldn't just be businesses that get access to Mm. this. This is something that anyone who goes, you know what, if I can get more done in less time with less effort, I've got far better grounds to improve my mental health, improve my confidence, go and ask for that pay rise. It'll pay for itself in no time. And if you can get your boss to pay for it as well, double bonus. And I know some of you big income earners out there, you'll spend more on a freaking pair of shoes. So... (laughs) Come at me, baby. Uh, but right. yeah, so definitely get in in touch with Vanessa if you um, if you head up a workplace and you've got a bigger team. Um, can you just, in summary, maybe just list off some bullet points of some symptoms mm-hmm. of people who might be going too hard for too long and not know it? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it was really interesting here. Um, just going back to some of these, it was uh, how do we manage burnout? And mm. you know what? You don't want to manage burnout. You want to prevent it. Yeah. So prevention is key. So when you see yourself even having a whiff of some of these symptoms, do something about it sooner rather than later. So it would be extra tiredness. So if you're feeling like, you know, the alarm goes off in the morning and <laughs> and I get it, you know, I'm, I'm not a morning person. So I don't, I'm not one of these people that spring out of bed every day. So if you don't spring out of bed every day, it doesn't mean you're burnt out. Okay. It just means that you're a bit tired or whatever. Um, that's not a problem. All right. But what it is, if you really have trouble getting going throughout the whole day, you're feeling tired, there could be less interest. Stuff that you used to find interesting and you used to really enjoy doing, you're starting to think, oh, I just can't be bothered. Or having this really unhealthy association with work where I could go out and and leave work and have some fun with friends, but no, I want to stay and work. Um, When you see your productivity going down as well. So if you're working on something which would normally take you an hour and now it's starting to take you an hour and a half, two hours, you need a new plan. 
Okay, mm. so that's not working well for you as well. Um, it could just be that you start to feel a bit more down than what you have previously. That's not great too. You might start to feel a bit anxious about certain situations and you start to feel anxious about work and performance and things like that. That can also be a little bit of a sign of anxiety. So it could be physical or it could be mental. But if you don't feel like you have your full bucket of 100 energy credits that everyone should have in a day, think about what 100 energy credits was for you when you did feel like you're on top of the world. That's what you should be feeling like every day. And if you go for extended periods of time without feeling like you've got those 100 energy credits, then you're probably on some sort of path to burnout if it's been for an extended period. And I would honestly say as well, like there's a, a, a thing here from Daniel Hayes. I'm a psychologist myself and I've found it interesting that uh, the call in recent years for workplaces to factor in staff's mental health, um, that he thinks that's a good result. He said, that being said, workplaces can only do so much. So, don't leave your happiness, health and satisfaction to your employer. So, you can't outsource crap that you've got to fix yourself. So, if your life's a train wreck and you're binging Netflix till 1am and getting up at 6am and you're wondering why life is tough, going out on a limb, maybe watch one episode a night, be in bed by 10, read something with a dim light on. And drift off into the ether. Exactly. Success is just the sum of the parts. It's just really small things that you can do each day. I've just got a, like a boundary thing that I've put in. Like most nights, um, I will only really watch one show and it will need to be finished, I think, before like 10 p.m. Great. Um, yeah. Just it's healthy. Yeah. The shows, they're always going to be there. That's right, exactly. But I love what Daniel said. I I couldn't have said it better myself. I Mm. I think it is great that workplaces now understand that this is a thing. Uh, But at the end of the day, we also need to make sure that, you know, your happiness is your responsibility, no one else's. Mm. It's not your, you know, like your career is your responsibility. It's not your boss's. Um, We need to take responsibility to say, what do we need to support ourselves Mm. professionally, emotionally, to give us that level of happiness, to work on our professional development, to work on our personal development. Mm. So, you know, it's really, it's really funny. You know, I, I think that workplaces should pay for a lot of, you know, these kind of professional development programs and things like that. But I also think that like, there's a lot of people who, um, you know, the ones that I really know, like I've got people who come to us and they pay for their own individual coaching programs. And Mm. it's like, they get it. They get that their career development, that their ability to take their career into their own hands is their responsibility and no one else's. And it's the same with your happiness. You know, you, you just have to take it by the horns and realize that you, it's, it's still up to you to make the choices of who you talk to and I'm not take a, it on. I'm not a tax accountant, thank the Lord, the good Lord. <laughs> um, but I mean... I don't know. I'd, I'd be thinking that course is highly linked to my ability to earn an income, uh, but we'll leave it right there. Yes. I'm not <laughs> going to give tax advice on that. Can I say that anyone who does pay for any work that they do with us personally in our experience have claimed tax deductions? Really? Yeah. Just okay. Saying. But okay. again, that's, speak to your tax yeah, accountant on that one. Just all up to you. All um, up to you. Just flagging. So, just in bringing it home... Rachel Chow says, I'd love to hear their thoughts on how to maximize productivity and energy if you work at a computer all day. Oh, Is that kind yes. of like that, what I was telling Nath to do? Mm. Like just go for a walk, break it yeah. up. Definitely. Um, th- this is massive as to what we've been helping people and teams with during COVID mm. because uh, people are now getting working from home burnout. Mm. It's, it's quite a thing. So, we've got more burnout from being on Zoom and visit video chats um, for so long. I'm not a cat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that, I was in bed the other night looking at that. I was chuckling to myself. <laughs> 
<laughs> I honestly, oh, and that's, it's finding the small things that make you chuckle. Yes. I've got the dumb meme app called Nine Gag. Oh, okay. It's trashy. It's crap, but <laughs> gosh, it makes me chuckle. Oh. That's right. Make yourselves laugh. Make, it, make your own fun. Um, but people have got, people are exhausted from being on Zoom because our brain's working overtime, mm. interpreting ambiguous behavior of other people so <laughs> yeah. you know we, we are we are churning through energy credits dealing with that and people aren't taking breaks so think about it if you're in an office environment going to the bathroom probably takes about 300 steps mm. at home it probably takes about seven mm. so we need to get out there we need to if it's walk to work and that could literally mean go for a walk for half an hour and end up back at your home office that's totally fine too and tracy wants to know do you have any uh, book recommendations off the top of your head Yes, I think uh, Deep Work's a great one. I'm a big fan of that. Um, Atomic Habits is also quite a good one. Love that. Oh, I've just given away. Oh, I literally had 10 here that we posted out to winners on a webinar. Yeah, right. I sing that praise all day. Um, As far as recharge goes and sleep, Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep. I love that. You will prioritize sleep over everything once you read that. I gave that away. Last Christmas, before last, yep. like 20 copies to people. Yeah. Changed my life. It's great. And that's what I was talking about before. It's like before 10, a, 10 p.m., get your ass to sleep. Yeah. So, they're some of my favorite books. And I love, for accountability, The Obstacle is the Way by right. Ryan Holiday, which basically says that in any situation that could be perceived as suboptimal, 90% of people will see it as an obstacle. 10% will see it as an opportunity. Mm. So that's all around mindset and that's all around choosing how you react to a situation. So enough with the victim mentality, work out how you're going to be in that 10% way of thinking about things. Love it. Well, we've got an opportunity to go and get lunch now and then we're going to come back and do a couple of episodes uh, on the My Millennial Business Podcast and the My Millennial Money Express Podcast. We don't know what we're going to talk about yet. Make sure you subscribe to them. Uh, They might already be up before we release this episode so um, you can find Vanessa on Instagram at at hi underscore perform underscore ness love it thank you so much Vanessa and uh, thanks for joining us on behalf of the My Millennial Money community thank you very much for having me always great to chat later later